Suki Baxter, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited for this conversation. You're like one of those, um, you know, famous people to me because, like, I, you know, it's, you know, like when somebody like watches all your YouTube videos, it's like it, it, it feels very sort of asynchronous and and unbalanced. Like, oh, you're famous, and here I am talking to you. So how cool! Oh well, thank you so much. That's really sweet of you to say. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I kept uh, somehow the, the YouTube algorithm, like instead of, you know, showing me more and more outrageous things to get me upset, kept showing me more and more of your, you know, beautiful and useful videos. There that, you go. It, it's, it's, our, it's, our under, it's our underground way of like changing humanity, right? Instead of getting more outrage, we'll get everyone nice and centered and regulated. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it really is, you know, we're, we're, we're joking, but it really like the more I see the world... And the more parts of me just want to become enraged and, you know, and fight against things like there's a deeper part of me that understands that this, there's so much trauma and that being being a person who can um, co-regulate in the other direct in the direction of healing might have more positive effect than all the activism that I could think of. Uh, well, I think nervous system regulation is activism. It's everyday activism. Ooh, ooh, there's a quote that's going, that's going in the show notes. So, um, so before, yeah, I want to dive right into that, but I think it would be useful for, for the audience to kind of know what we're talking about when we say, you know, nervous system regulation and trauma and all that. And maybe we could start with you just telling a little bit about your story and your journey to, sure. uh, to where you are and what you do. Sure, absolutely. So um, I started my journey, I was very fortunate when I was quite young, I was in my early 20s. Um, and I stumbled into a type of integrative body work that um, had a really profound effect, not just on my physical well being, but also on my psychological and emotional well being. Um, and I had been looking for help with some physical injuries and um, aches and pains related to athletics. But what I discovered was that anxiety that I had always had, that I didn't know I had, I'd never been diagnosed with anxiety, I didn't use the word, um, I never identified with it, but I had anxiety and it disappeared. And I felt happy and creative and comfortable in my own skin and just better than I really ever had. It was the only thing that had ever had that kind of impact on me. And so out of college, I took a nice hard left turn. <laughs> and, uh, instead of going down the corporate road, I did for a while, but, um, but I very quickly realized that wasn't where I wanted to be, uh -huh. which actually circles back to talking about the activism. Um, and uh, I decided to pursue learning about the body work. Well, I practiced that for a long time. And what kind of led me to the nervous system work that I do now is that what I learned um, to explain how the body work was working, how it was impacting my clients didn't match what I was observing in my office. So people would come in and what we're taught is like, you go to manual therapy or you, you know, you go get massage, whatever. And you're taught like the practitioner is physically breaking up adhesions. They're manually mm. stretching muscles and fascia and making them longer or whatever. And that's what creates change. And that's why we, our posture changes and that's why our movement gets better. But that didn't map for me because I would literally have people who come, who would come into my office and I swear to you, they would get better almost just being in the room with me. It was, you know, we, I, I didn't do a lot. They, they just changed easily. And then I had other people who would come in who, it, no matter what I did, I didn't feel like I could impact them. I, I'm seriously, I'm hyperbole, but I always joke that like, I felt like I could use a jackhammer and I still wouldn't get any effect. And I was the same practitioner with the same level of strength. So, you know, that didn't match this idea that I was manually stretching tissue. Um, and so I went on a very long journey and studied lots of different things and learned lots of different things. Um, but every time I learned something, it always brought me back to the nervous system. And I started learning about trauma and learning about polyvagal theory uh, and learning about um, how stress states impact our posture and our outlook on life and our thoughts and our feelings and all of the things. Um, and then about six years ago, I adopted a wild horse. I've always had horses, but I adopted a wild one. And he became my master teacher on the nervous system um, and really drove home, you know, all of the different puzzle pieces that I had really came together in working with him 
and helping him to adapt to everyday life. And so I took those lessons that I'd learned and all the information, and now I work with the nervous system. Wow. So there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so when you say you're, you're a body, doing integrated body work, <clears throat> so for people who aren't familiar with that term, can they picture, like, your clients on a table and you're, like, massaging or pulling or stretching or doing, doing something to them physically? Yeah. Yeah, basically, <laughs> manual uh -huh. therapy and, and movement coaching, yes. Okay, because I, I uh, graduated from the Somerset School of Massage Therapy in 1990, and <clears throat> the big thing then, we, we were going, like, uh, Robert King was the president of the American Massage Therapy Association, and he had this thing he would do with his elbow, mm -hmm. right? which was like fascial release, it was as close as you could, you could get to rolfing without being a rolfer. Yep. And then I thought, well, this is good, then rolfing is better. So I got rolfed, which for people who don't know, is basically someone just beats you up for 10, 10 weeks in a row to the point where, you know, and I thought it was working because at the end of each session, I didn't hurt where I had been hurting. Right. right. Um, so, and that's, that's what I did. That's what I practiced. I was, a, I, I went to the Rolf Institute and practiced Rolfing for about 15 oh, years. Okay. Yeah, so, so there's a lot to unpack there too, because I, it sounds like you received that work at a time when, um, that was they were very focused on intensity and like a very aggressive approach i got my training sort of as that phase was passing and there was a lot more emphasis on like the biodynamic stuff um you know there were people who were bringing in philosophy from biodyn biodynamic craniosacral and a lot of the fluid stuff and so there was it was much less intense and much more working with the body's natural rhythms so for anyone who's you know looking mm. at rolfing like it's changed as all things do it has changed over the uh -huh. years um fortunately and it's no it it shouldn't any longer be so aggressive it shouldn't feel like getting beat up but yeah i mean that's exactly it is that i'm sure when you were getting rolf that that was the explanation they they had was like we're getting in there and we're stretching the fascia or breaking up the fascia right 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 and and the fact that okay if you feel the pain then it's leaving the body essentially you're experiencing it Right. And my well, and, experience and, was when they they took, you know, before and after photo of me in my in my tidy whities And I definitely had a different posture, you know, three months later. But then it went right back. Like whatever had been done, whatever it, it didn't address the level at which I had created the dysfunctional posture and movement patterns. Right. Which is your nervous system pathways. And I, as a practitioner, if I'm doing manual therapy or rolfing or whatever, um, I, as a practitioner, don't own your nervous system. And that's where I got to. And um, I had gotten to that place that's actually uh, a big part of, of how I landed, you know, doing the work that I'm doing now. I'd gotten to that place in my practice and I was frustrated uh, because people would come in and they were asking me a question like, what's the best stretch to do for my hamstrings? Or, you know, how do I keep my shoulder mobility or whatever, which are great questions, but they were being asked from this place of almost believing that it's, that the, the culprit in the flexibility issue was this physically too short muscle. The muscle is short because it's contracting and there's some mm -hmm. physical, you know, we all have different structures, but uh, you know, if one side is tight, it's tight because it's contracting. The muscle is contracting. Why is it contracting? Well, it, because the muscle is receiving a signal from the brain, from the nervous system to tighten. Okay. Why is it receiving that signal? And that's where we start talking about like, okay, well, what has your lived experience been? What traumas have you experienced? Are they physical? Are they emotional? What patterning do you have? What, what movement patterns do your family, you know, did you come through your family, uh, through your culture? It's like, it's actually this huge question that can't really be addressed in how do I stretch my hamstrings? Like hmm. The question itself is too small. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, yeah, I remember um, one of the textbooks that we were told to read. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. it was Job's Body. Yep. Um, and up near the beginning, he had a story about some, you know, an old guy who came in, who, you know, crickety, could barely, you know, move, bend, sit. And then, you know, he was in the hospital and they, they did an operation. They knocked him out. And then all of a sudden he was basically like, a rubber band like he could put his yes. foot his foot over his head like so like when he woke up then immediately all the restrictions returned and i thought about that like that's 
that totally doesn't track with my understanding of my mess as biomechanical. Right, because um, because flexibility, actually, tension is consciousness, right? So when we have physical tension in our bodies, that's our consciousness. It's our it's our nervous system being on. And so, like you said, you take the nervous system out by putting you under and that flexibility. I actually uh, talked to a surgeon about that or a, no, he was an anesthesiologist. And so all of our tension doesn't completely disappear. Like we don't become a noodle, which was what I was taught. Mm -hmm. um, but you do, you know, they do have to be careful moving you because you can dislocate joints and, and all of that physical restriction goes away when you're put under anesthesia. And what's really interesting about that is it doesn't necessarily go away when you go to sleep. You know, your brain is still online and there's something called habituated tension where, uh, you know, I would notice this with my clients when they would lie down on the table to get work, to, to receive work, that they wouldn't fully relax onto the table. Like shoulders would still be held up. You know, I mean, the tension that we hold all the time, it's there whether you're relaxing on the couch or lying on a table or sleeping in bed. It's your consciousness. It's the pattern that you've habituated over your life. And it is intrinsically linked to your mental and emotional experiences. So people always talk about changing your thoughts, right? If you change your thoughts, you change your reality, and that can be true. Um, but thoughts are arising not just from, you know, there's deliberate thoughts that we choose. I can choose to think a thought. I can choose to think about my horses, which makes me very happy. There's also reflexive thoughts, and those thoughts pop up like little pop-up windows on your computer. And those are arising from neural activity that's happening in your brain and in your body. So those habituated tension patterns are linked to thought patterns. They're related. So when we break up those habituated tension patterns, we're creating space for new neural connections and potentially new thoughts to arise. Yeah, I remember when I met my own habituated tension for the first time, um, I was in some, like a group doing, a, you know, sort of, um, you know, deep group work. And one of the activities was you lay down on a, on a mattress and then people would like move your arms and legs. It was like very relaxing. And I'm just like, like I'm a total noodle. And someone kept saying, relax your arms. And I'm like, dude, they're relaxed. They're relaxed. And then I realized like no one was touching me and they were like floating nine inches off the ground. And yeah. I'm like, no, no, they're told, I've given you all the weight of my arms. It's like, no, they're, <laughs> they have minds of their own. And you know, it was, it was kind of shocking that I could, I could not will myself to let go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to yield your weight to the ground or into somebody else's hand, right? To their, yeah. to their, to their grip, yeah. Right, and, and of course, all of that, in just, in, just in biomechanical terms, like, I'm exhausted just, you know, by using unnecessary yeah. tension all the time. Absolutely, yeah, it's exhausting. There's a lot of fatigue. I would notice that people would receive manual therapy, and this this happens a lot when people start doing nervous system work. I I no longer practice on people because, like I said, I don't own their nervous system. So now I teach people how to do this for themselves, so they own it in, mm. inside their own bodies. Um, but I notice that when people are entering into this work, whether they receive manual therapy and that's their doorway in, or they start doing this work where they're learning how to kind of tend to their own nervous system, that one of the common things that people report um, in the initial stages is that they sleep so deeply. Not everyone, but a lot of people will just start sleeping so deeply. And I think what you're talking about is really relevant, you know, where it's like we've held on to all this habituated tension and you finally let it go and your body's like, oh, I can finally rest. I'm not constantly working to hold myself up. Yeah. So what if the body has this wisdom, right? It knows like when when we can intervene or when people can intervene on their nervous system, we don't have to like. Uh, program what the body should do. The body, like oh yeah, like the body knows how to relax. What's but what stops it from doing that in the first place? What overrides our innate intelligence and makes us into tense, nervous wrecks? Well, I don't think that relaxation is the only piece of intelligence, right? Like, I mean, I think tension is part of intelligence. Our body's very smart. Um, and I think like a lot of times we get led to believe that the things we experience that are not pleasant, like tension and anxiety and depression are problematic. Most of the time, it's actually uh, evidence that your nervous system is working perfectly. Hmm. Um, so, you know, you develop patterns of tension to shortcut. You know, we, we, get, we get habitual patterns of tension to make our movements more efficient, right? It's like a shortcut. Um, so if you have a neural pathway, you're going to use it over and over and over again 
But what tends to happen is that we use, uh, particularly in modern life, we don't get a lot of stimulation, right? We live in very square environments. We sit in chairs all the time. We don't have a lot of diversity in our movement. And so we don't use a broad array of movement repertoire. So our, our bodies become very efficient at doing what we do all the time, which unfortunately isn't varied. Um, and so we hold on to that tension over time just from habit because these are our most used neural pathways. They're the easiest ones to fire. You will, you're going to use your most efficient neural pathways because it burns the least amount of calories. It requires the least amount of effort. It's very hard to develop a new neural pathway, especially as an adult. You know, when you're a kid, you're flailing, flailing around all the time trying to figure this out and get coordinated. That's why mm -hmm. everyone's clumsy for a while as a child. Um, there's also tension that's related to, you know, self-protection. So a lot of people will talk about muscle armoring, right? So if we've had emotional injuries, we may develop habitual tension related to that. Uh, we just, it's emotional patterns, thought patterns, physical movement patterns. The more efficient they can be, the more energy we can conserve. And that's why we tend to get, you know, we tend to get tight um, in these very specific ways. There's also the effects of trauma. So trauma is a loaded word. It's one I have come to have almost like a love hate relationship with um, mm. because it's so it's so overused right now. Um, to be human is essentially to have some trauma. We all have something. I look at trauma as the the artifact in your nervous system of an experience or the artifact in your nervous system of something that your ancestors experienced. It's not actually the event or thing that happened to you, it's the state your nervous system is in. And modern life moves very, very quickly. It's very intense, there's a high level of intensity. And we do not have a lot of built-in triggers for regulation, for coming down after a stressful experience. A lot of us were raised by caregivers who had their own trauma and didn't have those skills, and so we didn't have it patterned for us as children. And so we can get triggered into stress states, which then become normal. Uh, like mine, you know, I, like I said, I had anxiety, but I didn't know I had anxiety. I was in a chronic stress state. Um, and we can look at all kinds of reasons that might've been, there wasn't, and have a horrible childhood. You know, I didn't, I don't have a high ACEs score. Um, and yet I was in a chronic stress state. I, I have reasons for that. I know my history and I, I can kind of look at my ancestral patterns and my caregiver patterns and all of that. Um, but that was just my normal. I functioned at that level every day. And that happens for a lot of people because our nervous systems just don't know how to come out of that state. Mm. Um, and then that becomes our, our almost like our operating system for navigating through the world. It's how we function. Yeah. So what struck me, what you just said is, so I've, I've thought of trauma as, you know, I think following like Bessel van der Kolk and, and folks like that as, you know, or, or Gabor Mate as, you know, things that happen to our response to things that happen to us that we couldn't fully be present for at the time. And I've always thought of it as something a little overwhelming, like it was too big for me or too scary. But when you talk about it in modern life, it could just be something normal that we just don't have time to process at all. It could be a, 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 a small thing that somehow just like a, a, you know, a little pebble in the shoe, that it was no big deal. But if I, if, I, if I don't have time to stop and shake out my shoe, it turns into a very big deal over time. Yes, I love that analogy. That's so good. Um, and there's also stimulus stacking, right? So um, one thing in isolation might not be a problem, but so much comes at us in modern life. So you may have, you know, a busy, you, you may have stressful uh, stuff going on at work, like deadlines and reports and, you know, uh, maybe you don't get along with your coworkers, or your boss or something like that. Um, and so that's adding stress. And then also there's something going on with your kid at school, you know, some, some kind of friction there that you have to deal with. And then also maybe there's some relationship stress. And then, you know, there's a medical emergency. Now you've got financial stress. Um, and these things, and these are all, you know, the things I'm naming are all pretty big things. <laughs> but you can imagine, like, one of these things might be manageable. And then you get a whole suite of these things and our nervous system can't handle them. But the same can be true on like small levels, right? So it can be something like, you know, you've, you've got um, a burst pipe at home and you've got a flat tire and, you know, like little things like that can add up and become overwhelming. 
And it can also be that you're holding on to that chronic stress state in your nervous system. It's your normal. You don't even know you're doing it. Most people don't unless they have symptoms. Um, and those symptoms have to be linked back to it, which they're often not, which is a whole other conversation. But you may have a, a chronic stress state in your nervous system or be holding on to some kind of trauma. And then something seemingly minor happens, like someone says something kind of cutting to you, like a little offhand remark, or you get in a tiny fender bender and you're not physically injured, but you just come apart. You know, something like that where it's it's like people almost look at you and say you're overreacting, mm -hmm. but you're not because that stimulus was just enough. If you think of like a glass of water that's brimming and then you just add one drop more to that glass and it overflows, you know, that can be how that how stimulus stacking works. Hmm. I've uh, had that experience where, <laughs> where you know, I, I come across typically as a very measured, sane person. And, you know, I could feel like, you know, in those days I call it like the amygdala hijack. Um, mm -hmm. and just like not, not, even, not even understanding what was going through me. Having a vague sense of this isn't going to end well. And having to do tons of damage control later, um, and essentially, you know, being the same person. So, like, like being really confused at that point as to like what what happened, and and then terrified that it was going to keep happening because it seemed so out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And it's usually not rational, right? Like, usually, like you said, you're confused, um, and and it seems out of character or like why did I behave in that way? And you can't rationalize it. I, I hear yeah. this from a lot of people where it's like, I, it's not my thoughts. It's not my conscious mind that's doing this. It's like something deeper or something else. And it's, it's your nervous system. It's those parts of you that are ancient that are trying to keep you alive. Um, and it's your stress response basically is what it is. Uh, and it bypasses all of your rational thinking. Mm -hmm. And as you know, when I started incorporating this into my coaching and I coach both, you know, executives and, civilians around health issues. Um, this like this was the thing that started making me a more effective coach was just the, the, the neuro or the psychoeducation for people that this is not in our control and that the way we behave, you know, like clients who are overeating on something or are eating foods that they tell themselves day after day that they're going to avoid. I'm not going to turn left and go to 7-Eleven and pick up the Slurpee. I'm not going to do this. I'm, and they end up making the bad decisions day in and day out. They cannot understand it. They can't explain it. And the, only, and the brain's always looking for an explanation. And the only explanation they have is there's something really wrong with me or I'm a sinner, I'm a fallen okay. person, and helping them to see that there's a nervous system that is that has plays by its own rules. And we're not powerless. We have a great deal of power. But if we try to cognitively corral the nervous system, we can't do that for very long. Oh, I love that. I think it's one of the most toxic things that we're taught, you know, through the personal development world is that we can just control all of our reactions. And if we, if we're doing something we don't like, it's just that we don't have enough willpower um, or we're not disciplined enough or what, you know, it's phrased in different ways. Um, and you're right. These nervous system patterns are super powerful and we can absolutely change them because of neuroplasticity. So we can change our brains. We can change our nervous systems. We can change our responses. Everything is available for shifting. Uh, but you, like you said, you got to know where to work because you can't just constantly like, try to override these biological responses with executive control, it fails. It just, at some point it will fail. It might work in the short term, but usually people find that there's a place where it just falls apart. Yeah. So um, I feel the need to pivot to good news, right? So we've kind of laid out the, the problem. Um, so what did, what did you start discovering when you were doing your, um, I forget what Rolfing's officially called, integrative something? It's officially called Rolfing, uh, but they also call it structural integration. Structural integration. Yes. Okay. So like, what, what did you start discovering when you were asking this question, why am I effective with some people and not others? What were, what were the things that started working for, for you? Well, it was a very long journey. <laughs> 
um, because I, I did that work for about 15 years. And so in the early days, you know, I, I actually remember way back in the day before, you know, this is, I think like this is before Facebook. I remember talking to somebody about this Facebook thing and someone was writing on his wall and I'm like, what? Yeah. What what wall? You don't have a house. Like I was so yeah. confused. <laughs> so you know, this is this is before podcasts, before before YouTube. I mean, way back in the day. Um, and I'm really dating myself here, but um, <laughs> but I remember being like, I think it's the nervous system, and actually even kind of looking into like, should I study neuroscience? Should I go down that road? But then I kind of found like, no, this isn't. You know, they're not looking at it the same way I am. And I'm going to have to put electrodes in mouse brains, and that's just not going to work for me. <laughs> so, uh-huh. uh, so I ended up not going down that path, um, and I explored a lot of really great modalities, a lot of energy healing modalities, um, and a lot of movement modalities, um, and. What I, what I loved was that everything always brought me back to the nervous system, right? So electricity runs through our nervous system. So when we're talking about the energy healing, I would always come back to like, oh, it's the nervous system again. Movement modalities. I'm like, right, people are owning their nervous systems. They're changing their, they're, they're affecting neuroplasticity through choosing different movement habits. Um, in terms of the things that I really found that worked I really found that slowing down is incredibly important. Um, When I would ask clients to move, turn your head, lift your arm, walk across the room, something like that. Would you mind doing this thing? So that I could observe their movement patterns. Most people do it very quickly. They're very results oriented. They're not looking at turning their head as an exploration of what is my movement like between facing forward and facing to the side, they're looking at achieving having my head to the side, (laughs) right? Like I need to get from here to there. The faster you move, the more likely you are to fire your dominant nervous system patterns, your your neural pathways, because it's habits, efficient, it's strong, it's easy. It's like driving down a super highway. When we want to create new neural pathways, we're kind of bushwhacking. And so slowing down creates um, space. It creates the ability to explore movement, to create a new pathway. It creates more awareness. Um, The slower you're moving, the more sensory information can come into your brain and be assimilated, right? Because um, you talked about the body's innate intelligence. Uh, We're information machines. We are constantly in relationship with our environment and everything in it, the people, the organisms, the objects, all of it. We are relating. Right now, my pelvis is relating to my chair, which is relating to the floor. My feet are balancing that, right? I am in relationship with gravity through my seat. I'm relating to you, looking at you and and seeing you. I'm taking in information and that's informing my nervous system so that there can be a response. Most people are in a reactive state, right? We've patterned already, we're adults, not children, but adults, we've already patterned. We take in that information and there's a reaction to it because we did something that worked in the past. So we do that same thing again, which is great, honestly, to come back to like, you know, the survival pattern, it's your nervous system working. It just might not be the optimal pattern for what you're wanting to achieve. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's or, or slowing that down. Yeah, sorry, keep going. Go ahead. Let's say that, that the, okay, yeah. uh, the, 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 we're reacting to our, our, our perception of what was similar in the past to this, right? So it worked then. And so if, we, if, if our nervous system is in a state of, of heightened fear, because, you know, because like, you know, I just, you know, looked out the window and saw a crow. And when I was three, a crow scared me or, you know, something. I'm not actually present, Like the quicker I assess my surroundings and just say, oh, this is like that, then I'm actually living that instead of this. Right. And that's efficiency, right? So it's, it's exactly how we're supposed to work because this is how we become instinctively afraid of certain predators, which is great if you live in caves, hmm. super helpful, right? Like you don't <laughs> want to be like, oh, look at the fuzzy kitty with the big fangs. I wonder if it wants to be my friend. That's not helpful. You want to look at that and have like a gut level, like, uh, uh-uh, I need to go away in the opposite direction of that thing. It will eat me. Um, but it, it breaks down because in our modern environment, 
like you said, you can have um, a situation in your childhood where a certain response to the input is appropriate. So, for example, if you have a parent who slams drawers when they're irritable, they come, get home from work and they had a bad day and they're slamming things in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. You know that now is not the time to be like asking for things and, you know, probably bugging your parent, right? So I'm making this up, but just potentially if you go into the kitchen at that time and talk to your parent, you might get an irritable word, you know, irritation or, you know, a sharp word or something like that. You will learn to maybe get very quiet and maybe st you know, that could be a response. You know, somebody else might throw a fit, right? It depends on, uh, the dynamics are always different, but you might have learned like, oh, when someone's slamming, drawers and cupboards in the kitchen, it's a really good time to not be seen. Mm -hmm. And so your knee jerk response to that stimulus might be to become very quiet and maybe even freeze a little, you know, go into that dorsal vagal kind of response of, of like, I'm not really here. Don't see me. I'm just shut down uh, kind of response that may have worked when you were a child. When you're a child, you're not very powerful. You don't have a lot of survival ability. You need your caregivers. You have to um, appease them enough that they don't reject you on the biological level, right? You need to maintain relationship. This is hardwired. We've got to have relationship to somebody who can take care of us. Right. When you're an adult, that might not be a strategy that works. Like if your partner comes home and is slamming cupboard doors and you disappear, um, that might not, that might damage your relationship. They might, and I'm positing, right? Any number of things could happen in a dynamic, but it might be that your partner feels slighted or like you don't care, you know, that they had a bad day or you're not there to talk to them or something like that. But your biological response is to have almost like an anxiety when you hear that slamming because it wasn't a good thing in your house as a child, right? So we, we, we react to the stimulus in different ways. Um, to put it in really simple terms, I always say, like, if I showed you a red umbrella and then gave you an electric shock, after a long enough time, if I show you a red umbrella, you're going to be like, Pfft. you're going to mm. brace for the electric shock, right? So, like, we're doing that all the time. We just don't realize how much sensory information we're taking in, sight, sounds, smells, you know, the barometric pressure probably. And we, there's, there's a myriad ways that we sense. It's not just as simple as our five senses. There's so many ways that we sense into our external and internal environment at all times. Mm -hmm. So com coming back to you, talk, we were talking about slowing down as a central strategy for breaking some of these patterns. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, that seems like a fairly simple, maybe not easy thing to do. Um, but like, what's, what's an example of like people who are listening or watching now that's a, sort of an exercise in slowing down that we might try? Yeah, I think slowing down gets a lot of, so I'm very literal, I should say. <laughs> um, I think people are like, slow down your life. And it's this sort of metaphorical, like the pace of life is too quick, which I also agree with. But like on a really practical level, when you're doing a movement, um, pay attention to the space between the beginning and the end of that movement. So like the simple example of turning your head, you can slow that down to where it takes you 15 seconds to get your nose from pointing straight ahead to as far to one side as you can go. And it's not about straining to see if you can like crane further. It's like how slowly can you get from here to there and then the other piece of that is the slow creates opportunity for the sensory awareness. So the other piece is what do you notice as you're doing that? You know, what, what sensations come up to you? What do you notice about your neck, your movement, your back, your eyes, your breathing? What, what is there to notice in that movement? Because it's not about getting your head to the side. It's really about quality, like the quality of the tissue, the quality of the rotation. Mm. Um, and that's a simple example, but this can be taken to anything. You know, I think a lot of times embodiment is quantified as something you're doing in this culture. So a lot of times people are like, so what should I do? Go to yoga? Maybe. Hmm. I mean, you can do yoga in a very embodied, attentive way where you're receiving a lot of sensory information. You're very present to the experience. Or you can do yoga in a very disembodied way where you're simply going through the motions and you're not actually sensing your body. 
Same is true. Yeah, or I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to hold the uh, the position longer than Peter next to me. Right. It's, it's, it becomes like an achievement thing, right? Like, yeah. I got to get my heels to the ground when I'm in down dog or else I'm not good or whatever, you know, I don't know. Um, but like embodiment becomes something that infuses the activities that you're doing. It's not mm-hmm. something you do apart from them. So really attending to the stuff you're already doing, like when you're washing dishes in the kitchen, can you actually feel your feet on the floor or have you completely lost connection with your feet? Can you do both at the same time? Mm. Not you specifically, but anyone, anyone who's listening, you know, <laughs> I don't, when, I don't when like to brag, but the, I, I can stand and watch it <laughs> at the same great. time. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, it's a little bit of life. <laughs> I don't, I don't have the footage to prove it yet, but uh, <laughs> take my word. I'm sure you'll get it on YouTube soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what it reminds me of, I mean, when, you know, you're kind of talking about like the nervous that you kept coming back to the nervous system, like all these different modalities and, and all the different modalities kind of have mythologies around them. So like, unlike you, I didn't explore all these things as a practitioner. I explored them as a client, but, you know, Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, Traeger Mentastics, um, you know, dozens of stuff like that. And they all had their own stories. But like what you were talking about turning the head, that was very much the Feldenkrais work, like turn real slow or lift your arm just an inch. Real. And then it was like magic, right? Like you do these couple of movements for two or three minutes and then to say now, okay, now turn to the side and I could go 40% farther than mm-hmm. I could have gone before. And in my mind, I'm like attributing some sort of sorcery to Feldenkrais or Alexander Technique, but you're, you're kind of saying like there is a, a fundamental physics or a fundamental reality that anything that kind of brings your nervous system into um, more sensitive attunement to its environment is going to help you release stuck patterns. Yes, um, I will say, Attending to sensory information is very important, but people can get also hyper attached to sensory information and then start to make too much meaning out of it. Right. So it's really, um, it's really important to try to avoid making stories. Um, so a lot of times, yeah. So a lot of times I'll ask a client, what do you notice in your body? And I don't actually get an answer or I might get a half an answer. They'll be like, Oh, it's tight here. And that's because on Tuesdays, you know, when the moon is blue, um, I, you know, go to dance under the trees and the, I don't know, like, you know, you get this whole story about, or, you know, often there's like, well, normally when I sit at my desk and, da, 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 and that they've left the moment. Right. So they're now in the story about the sensation and not mm. actually in the sensory information. Uh-huh. Um, um, or they'll give it a label. Like I feel tightness in my chest. I'm anxious, you know, and then they're really fixated on anxiety, which is actually the subjective interpretation of what you're feeling. Right. So then I always come back to like, okay, how do you know you feel anxious? What's the somatic anchor for that? What are you feeling in your body? Oh, if you t- feel tightness in my chest. Okay. Is it okay to just attend to the tightness without giving it a meaning? Right. Cause as soon as we jump into the story about it, we're no longer in the experience of it. Mm-hmm. What, yeah, one of the things that I discovered was so powerful. I think I got it from a Peter Levine. Um, in his book, In an Unspoken Voice, was the idea, like, it's really hard. Like, I would do anything to avoid feeling shame, right? Like, that's that's one of those emotions, like, you know, I'd rather die than feel shame. And yet, when you when I don't call it shame, when you just ask me, what's the somatic anchor? What are you feeling in your body? And I go, there's a heat, there's a depression in my belly. There's, like, and you go, like, how, you know, how hard is that for you to endure? I'm like, you know, dude, I've had root canal. This is, it's like, it's, it's not nothing, but without the subjective interpretation of shame, the physical sensations aren't that bad usually. And that was, that was a yeah. revelation for me. Yeah, it's, it's true. Often the physical sensations aren't that bad. I do want to have the caveat that if you have experienced trauma or if you have trauma in your body, sometimes putting your attention on physical sensations can be very triggering. 
Mm. So a lot of people who've had trauma will dissociate because it gets so loud and overwhelming, like loud in air quotes, but overwhelming in their body that when you start to bring their attention back inside, they can be like, "Mm -mm, too much, you know, it's too triggering to even be in that space. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to note that like everyone's relationship to physical sensation can be really, um, really different, but yeah, you know, going away from the story or the label of an experience and actually into the experience, sometimes we find that actually the experience is fine. Yeah. And yeah. And and that's one thing I wanted to ask you is that I often have, you know, clients where I can see there's some agitation going on and Mm -hmm. and we can talk about like polyvagal theory. I think it'd be be useful to kind of frame, frame it with that. But like, I'm always working with my clients to get them into ventral vagal, to get them into what we call social engagement or safety. And, And one of the ways in which I've learned to help clients get there is to ask them to do something somatic to like, Hey, just notice your breathing or notice, do a body scan. And I will have clients who are, who they don't understand the words I'm using when I'm saying like, what are you feeling in your body? And oh like, yeah. I, I don't, you know, like, like I'm speaking another language. And so my understanding from polyvagal theory is that they are in some form of dorsal vagal collapse or fold or dissociation. Um, first of all, is that, you know, is that your experience? Is that what's always going on? And what do you, what do you do to help someone who can't do these basic um, somatic in, uh, interrogations of themselves? Such a great question. So I'd say it depends because um, it can be dissociation. It can be that they have no access to their body because they're just not able to connect to physical sensation because it wasn't safe at some point or it's overwhelming in there. Um, but really, I think it's cultural. You know, we do not like our bodies. We are actively conditioned away from anything physical, from experiencing anything physical. We're not allowed to have physical pleasure. When we're young children, we progressively learn to sit still and not follow our natural urges to move. You know, recess gets taken away. We have to ask permission to even go to the bathroom. We are not allowed in our culture, in a Western culture. I can only speak for my own experience in my culture, but in a Western culture, we are not allowed to relate to our bodies very much. It's discouraged. And we're often taught, um, you know, there's almost like a lot of puritanical values that are that are infused in our culture. And we're almost taught like our body will lead us astray, you mm-hmm. know, into gluttony. You can't trust our hunger because then you'll be just a glutton. You'll just eat like all the bags of potato chips that exist on the planet if you let yourself have potato chips that you want. You know, you can't trust your hunger. You can't trust your desire. You can't trust your body, anything that's physical at all. Um, so there's that aspect. But also we have no lexicon for it. You know, no one ever asks people. <laughs> what they feel in their body. So one of the skills I teach people is sensory language, how to feel and label a sensation. It's just a skill. And a lot of people, once they start developing the skill, it's like, Oh, I can do this, mm. you know, and then they, they just get better at it as they attend to it. Mm. But they just, you know, you don't probably notice the feeling of your clothes on your body because you're so used to it, unless they're bothering you in some way, you know, unless mm-hmm. you have like a really tight belt and it's pinching or something. Um, or shoes that are uncomfortable. But if you stop for a moment and think about it, like I can feel my shirt moving when I do, right? I can feel it sliding over my skin. I can notice that. Yeah. And it, I just had to pay attention. And so learning to feel your body is kind of the same. We don't really pay attention to those sensations that are there all the time. But when we kind of help people stop and notice those things, um, then they just develop the skill of noticing and labeling and being like, Oh, I feel heaviness in my stomach. I just didn't know I was feeling that. I didn't uh-huh. know how to quantify it and share it. And if, like, when I think about learning a language, there's, there's the teacher who can give you the right answer. If you don't know the name, you know, the word for, for, you know, it's noodles or something, they can say, well, this is the word for noodles, but, but you, you know, like you don't own their nervous system. You don't own their sensations. How do people get, um, confident that they're saying the right words. Yeah, there are no wrong words. And, and feeling nothing is feeling something. That's another thing to keep in mind. So if they're like, I don't feel anything, I can't feel my body. Hmm, okay. How is hmm. it to not feel your body? Let's work with that. What is that? Let's talk about the nothingness. Is it everywhere? Hmm. 
Like, let's identify it more. I feel nothing. Well, maybe I feel my left calf a little. Okay. All right. Mm. How much of your left calf do you feel? Where does it start and where does it stop? You know, just familiarizing people with their sensory experience. Um, I like to start with open questions. Like, what do you notice? Which people hate. Because they're like, I don't know. What are you talking about? It's way too open. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I'll drill down. You know, if someone's really struggling, I might start to lead them a little. Like, why don't you uh, walk a little bit? What are you noticing in your feet? I'm not going to say, do you notice that you're slamming your heels on the ground? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's that's telling them what I'm experiencing in their movement. But I might I might say, you know, if I'm starting to hear like a loud heel strike and they're really walking heavily, I might say, what do you notice about your step? Is it even, you know, do you, do you hit the same place right to left? Just does the first, you know, is it your heel that hits right and left? Is it exactly the same? Do you have the same weight on your feet? Do you put more weight on the front of your feet or the back of your feet? So I'm going to start asking them questions more specifically but I'm still not telling them what they're experiencing. I'm allowing them to discover it for themselves. Mm. It reminds me of an experience I had at, at a physical therapy session where just for kicks, the therapist asked me to become ambidextrous with my throw. And what that involved was like really slowing down the mechanics. I'm left-handed and I've always had a really good overhand throw from baseball and other sports. And my right hand was, uh, you know, like, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex thing. And by slowing it down, I'm, I could realize, I, oh, like there are inflection points. There is there is a system. There's a structure. And I was able to mimic the good throw with the in, in, inexperienced arm. And it really was eye-opening. Yeah. Yeah, and really noticing, you know, what that movement feels like on the right and then being able to match it on the left. I love that exercise. Yeah. Um, so can we talk a little bit about polyvagal theory, which I think is probably how I found your um, your ch your YouTube channel in the first place? Maybe because like, sure. what, what, what is it for you and how, how is it? Why yeah. is it important? Yeah. So, you know, polyvagal theory was developed by Stephen Porges, I'm sure, as you know, um, and it's been around for a while, but it's really kind of having a moment right now. It's a very useful framework for understanding the stress response in the body. Um, there's a lot of debate going on about polyvagal theory right now. So the way that I use it is it really maps with what we observe in how people exhibit stress and stress symptoms. Um, I am less concerned personally with exactly what nerve is doing what thing, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of debate around that and, and kind of where I land with it because people are like, oh, it's, you know, it's useless, throw it out completely. And then there's other people who are like real adherents of it. And I'm kind of somewhere in the middle where I'm like, it's a really great framework. It's a theory. It's a really great framework that's very helpful for understanding where we are in our own stress response in our nervous system or a client if you're working with a client professionally. Um, and basically what Stephen Porges did was identify uh, different branches of the nervous system that are responsible for social engagement, which you mentioned. So our ability to be present, connected to other people and organisms, joyful. We have access to all the happy stuff, you know, the play, um, the, the you know, ability to be curious, you know, all the things that we associate with feeling good in life. Um, and that he correlated with the branch of the vagus nerve, which is why it's called polyvagal theory. It's related to the vagus nerve um, that is in the front of the body, the, the ventral vagal nerve. Um, and so he posited that that nerve was responsible for our ability to have social engagement, to be connected, to be present. Um, and then poly means multiple, right? So polyvagal, so there's two branches of the vagus nerve. Um, so the rear branch, the dorsal vagal nerve, is responsible for a shutdown state. So a state of freeze, a state of collapse. Um, you might think of it like playing possum. Um, this is correlated with a lot of times with like depression, uh, dissociation, lethargy, low energy, fatigue, things like that. It's, it's, um, it's the immobilizing branch of your nervous system. Uh, and then you have a third piece of your nervous, of your autonomic nervous system, uh, which is your sympathetic nervous system. And that's what most people are respond or uh, are familiar with in terms of being responsible for handling stress. It's your fight or flight response. It's the mobilizing branch of your nervous system. So when you feel 
um, threatened in some way, it's going to urge you to get up and take care of that. You're going to run away so that you can preserve your life or you're going to fight to preserve your life. It's more nuanced than that, but that's kind of the, the basic framework. So you've kind of got these three stages of activation. There's more, like I said, there's more nuances that are available, but if you kind of understand those three, um, it's a helpful framework for kind of knowing like, oh, I'm feeling very anxious and jittery right now. Hmm, I'm, I'm in kind of a fight or flight branch of my nervous system. Or if you're in depression and lethargy and just unable to find any motivation and just feel uninterested, even in things that you normally are super interested in, mm. um, that's more the shutdown branch, right? And most people talk about nervous system regulation. Like I heard you mention, you know, you work with clients to get them into that ventral vagal social engagement, which is great because that's where we feel really good. Um, but I think there's a myth out there that like we should always be in social engagement. And that's not true. A healthy mm. and well-regulated nervous system has access to all of these because we need our stress response to deal with life. If we never got stressed, we would just get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. We'd not be here. <laughs> you know, we, we would have disappeared a long time ago. When something, um, when we need to move, we need our sympathetic nervous system to help mobilize us. You know, mm. it's, it's useful. We can't stay in sympathetic for a super long time either. That's why a lot of times you'll be in sympathetic. And if it's chronic and ongoing, you start to get fatigue and depression. And that's your emergency break. It's your dorsal vagal controlling that. All of these things need to be active. We need to be able to get in and out of these different states. We just don't ever want to be completely stuck in any of them and unable to access the others. Mm hmm. Right. And so, you know, you mentioned earlier about like this toxic myth of personal development culture. Um, and I, th I think if when I first encountered polyvagal theory, like I just felt like, oh, that that explains so much about what had not been working for me about things like, you know, cognition, like cognitive behavioral strategies. Uh -huh. Right. Because, you know, and, and, and I think they're wonderful. I use cognitive behavioral strategies as a coach all the time. But I find I can only use them when my clients and I are in ventral vagal, when we have access to the parts of the brain that, you know, that groove on cognition. Um, but that asking people to be cognitive, you know, to, to um, debate and override dysfunctional thoughts when their nervous system is producing those thoughts. It's like what we, we said at the beginning, like the you're 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 trying to pluck weeds out from the top of the uh, instead of pulling them out by their roots. Yeah, well, and I think it's really important to know, too, that, you know, the state your nervous system is in is going to change your perception of reality. So that's why this is so foundational and why I find like a lot of top down um, uh, personal development strategies to be very limited in their effect, because if you are stuck in sympathetic, you're stuck in fight or flight. You're always in a stress state. The world starts to look very dangerous. There's actual physiological changes. You will start to perceive neutral faces as more dangerous. So neutral facial expressions start to look angry or aggressive. Your hearing tunes into low frequency predatorial sounds. Like you start to feel like everything coming into um, your environment is a threat, not cognitively. You're not, it's not a thought based thing. You're not like, Oh, the world's a very dangerous place. Maybe, but it's more biological. Um, and you know, I, I have a background in pain science because most people come to manual therapy because they have pain. And so from a physical standpoint, if you are in a high, high state of stress in your nervous system, the, your own movement starts to feel threatening, right? That's why like old injury sites can be achy and painful even long after they've been healed. Because your body's like, hey, stretching the fibers of these tissues could be dangerous. We had an injury there. And the mm. more heightened the stress state, the more likely your body's own sensory, you know, the, the sensory information that's generated by the movement of your body, your proprioception, your interoception, all of that stuff starts to actually feel dangerous. And your brain starts to interpret that as pain. That's that's a lot of um uh, the problem in chronic pain that's like nonspecific, you know, meaning there's no injury the the doctors can't find anything physical to uh, account for the pain that someone is feeling. But the nervous system is reading movement and reading sensory input as painful inside the body. The same thing happens in our uh, in our thoughts, in our external environment. We're like this is a very painful environment to put it in air quotes. Right. And so if you're if you're in that state and someone tries to introduce new information, What's it going to feel like? A threat. 
So, so it's going to be very hard to learn and assimilate things when you're in a state where everything feels really dangerous. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to be able to get somebody to a state where their nervous system is receptive in order for change to happen. Mm. So I want to make sure we cover kind of what, you know, what you do. I know you have this incredible YouTube channel that people could spend, you know, years studying from and learning from. You also have a business <laughs> that, you know, you make money helping people also. Um, can you talk about like what you do professionally and who, who you work with and, you know, can people reach out to you from far away or is it only in person? Yeah, absolutely. So all of my work is online at this point. Um, I have a program, it's called the Nerve Apprenticeship, and I work with uh, predominantly people who are healers and world changers who want to learn the skill of regulating their nervous system through this sensory embodiment approach. So um, I teach a very progressive curriculum where, you know, it's skill building. So there's information, there's also practice so that people can actually learn and integrate these tools into their own lives. Um, and then we have a lot of people who are also professional practitioners as well. And so they integrate these tools into their work with clients. Um, and like I said, it's completely online. So it's available everywhere in the world. We actually have students pretty much all around the globe, um, which is really fun. And then we come together as a community as well, because, um, you know, nervous systems coming together with the mm. same intention really amplifies the effects of the work. So mm. that's what I am doing these days. And like you said, I also have my YouTube channel um, and I'm on and off of Instagram sometimes, depending on how I feel. Uh -huh. Have you noticed um, that there's a difference in how nervous systems interact digitally and, and with there's a difference, you know, video, audio visual or even different platforms? Um, you know, a lot of us, when we, the pandemic hit, we thought, well, this is maybe like the next best thing, but it's not so great. But there's ways in which working with people digitally gives you things that you don't get in person. What's, what's your experience been? Yeah. I mean, I think that digital is, is a tricky medium because again, our biology is old, you know, it's ancient. And so I don't think it's, it, it hasn't caught up to the digital world, um, in my, I don't have any real specific data on this, but just my own anecdotal experience is that it is trickier uh, to work digitally because we have um, it, we don't have the 3D reality, right? So you're not in person with somebody where like the directionality of their voice can matter. You know, I don't think we really realize. Um, one thing I notice when I'm in Zoom rooms is like someone will start talking and I get disoriented because the sound always comes from exactly the same place. So if there's multiple mm. people in the Zoom room, I'm like, wait, who's talking? Because in a 3D room, you would know like it's on this side of the room or that side of the room and you'd be able to turn towards it. So there are some downsides to the digital. We, we just, we miss some of the sensory input that we would get being in person with somebody. I think smell too. We don't talk about, you know, we're like, oh gosh, we shouldn't smell, but our bodies do smell. Mm. And I think on some level we miss that. Um, even if we're not consciously aware of it. Um, but yeah, the flip side is that, you know, I have had the wonderful opportunity to work with people all around the world and people are able to access training and education and resources and support and community that isn't necessarily available locally. So if I had to source, like if, if I were looking as, as my own client, if I were looking for my community in my local town, I'd be hard pressed to find the kind of cohesive group that we have inside my program. So it, it and I, a lot of people don't have it at all. You know, I have people in rural areas and, you know, yeah. very distant countries. And, and so they, they don't have access to, um, that kind of support. And so I think that, that the digital is a mixed bag. I think it's really worth, it's worth using. And also I think we should be conscious that it's not the same and cannot replace reality. Mm. Mm. So you, you mentioned you work with um, world changers and the first note I took was when you said at the beginning that nervous system regulation is activism. Can you kind of take, take that home for us? What do you mean by that? Sure. Sure. Well, um, as I mentioned, we are actively conditioned away from being in our bodies. 
that is a very uh, challenging place to be. So I look at the research on like amputee. So I, I relate a lot to pain science because it's my background. And so when amputees lose a limb, um, they have like phantom nerve pain, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a state of stress, right? So they, their body, and there's no limb to communicate the pain, right? Because the limb is gone, but their brain is like, I'm missing. That's a stress state. Your brain interprets part of you missing as a real big problem. Um, and so I think that the metaphorical amputation that a lot of us have from our bodies is putting us all into a state of stress, a state of frenzy. And we see it in the world with all like the outrage and the triggering and all the stuff. It's really intense right now. And I'm not saying people don't get triggered. I'm saying it's just a real intense environment. When we are living in our bodies and connected to our sensory experience, we know who and what we are. We know how we feel. We know what we want. We have access. We can be in a stress state. You can be in your body and still be stressed. But we generally will have access to being centered and being calm should we choose to be there. Um, and then we can make choices from that place. When you're constantly in a stress state and you don't know who and what and where you are, because you literally don't know who and what, like you literally don't know your boundaries, like where you begin and what is you and what isn't you, the inside and the outside. That is a way that people can be very steerable, right? Mm. I can now sell you anything because you huh. feel bad. You know, you feel anxious. You may not, you may not have much else to access, but you probably feel pretty anxious or some variation of anxiety. Well, now I can tell you that I have the solution for that. And that can be a handbag or a gadget or a political idea that I can tell you will solve that anxiety for you. I can sell you on a physical thing, a psychological thing, a way of life, almost anything. None of it will work <laughs> until you have that connection to, you know, to your physical body. So that's one way that I see it as being an act of, uh, 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 you know, activism, a form of everyday activism. Um, the other way that I see it is we're breaking generational patterns of trauma. Mm. We then don't pass them down to our children, which means that they're, I don't know what it looks like for them to grow up without that baggage, but I imagine we're going to have a lot more potential. Um, we're going to be a lot less tolerant of toxicity. We're not going to, you know, people who are in their bodies and connected to empathy and compassion within themselves are not going to tolerate toxic systems and oppressive systems. So it's like a grassroots change that I see not, not quickly overtaking the world, but very, very slowly. I think if everyone were to regulate their nervous system, we'd have a much healthier, happier, more collaborative planet. Mm, almost like uh, the Occupy movement has to start with occupying ourselves. Ooh, so well said. Yeah, oh, I love that. And it reminds me, I had a conversation a few years ago with Adrian Marie Brown, who wrote a book called Pleasure Activism, mm -hmm. that, which also was a phrase that I did not understand at the time, that that this very intimate act of claiming our own bodily autonomy is actually revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah, it's oh. very much related. I mean, I, I talk in my program a lot about desire. And how, you know, if you ask somebody what they want, like really what they want, a lot of us don't know. We actually hmm. don't know how to want. Hmm. We know how to follow rules and programs and external constructs. But like when you actually ask yourself, what do you want? And I'm not talking about like vision board want, you know, like what do you want out of life? What do you really want? What's your true desire? A lot of people kind of get deer in headlights. But when you connect to that, you know, that's, mm. in my opinion, that's a powerful place to work from. Yeah. And one, one experience I had was um, working with a group where the, the supposition was those longing, those, those desires that you're kind of ashamed of, like the things you don't, you think you shouldn't want are actually clues like that. They're, 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 they're somehow they have been so socially conditioned, but when we go be, below those, you know, if it's sex, what you really want is like universal connection. If it's food, you're looking for, you know, mother love, sustenance, like the, the, that all, yeah. all of the things, the, all the toxic addictions that we chase are actually, uh, you know, toxic ver 
versions they all of, come of back true. To, yeah, they all come back to regulating your nervous system. It all comes back to safety, right? We want connection because it's, it means safety. Like when you're mm. connected to a group of people or another person or, you know, whatever, a community of people, it means you have safety. Like it goes back to caveman days. You can't get kicked out of the cave. You can't make it out there on your own, right? And like food, you know, hunger is a form of agitation in your nervous system. So a lot of times when people are like trying to control their overeating, I'm like, why don't you try regulating your nervous system mm. and, and see if your hunger changes? Because it may be that you're really just trying to satisfy an overactive nervous system because of some something triggered your nervous system to be in that fight or flight, if you want to call it trauma or whatever. Um, and really, we're just trying to resolve that, that agitation. It all comes back to safety. Mm. Beautiful. It all comes back to safety. That might be the title. So I'm going to take a moment. <laughs> Yeah, I was reading Stephen Porges. Uh, I think he's put out his third book called Polyvagal Safety, which is a bunch of articles um, that he's co-written with other people. And one of them was about um, meditation and chanting. And he, and like you, he says, like, OK, let's we can understand every spiritual tradition from a ner nervous system perspective, like every everything that you, can be mapped onto this this fundamental human biology or mammalian biology. Of yeah, it absolutely. Is. Yeah, I totally believe that. Cool. So tell tell people where they can find you. I'll put it in the show notes also. But for folks who are just listening, how, let's, let's make it easy for them. Sure. Um, so the places you can find me are wholebodyrevolution.com. That's my website. Uh, and you can find me on social media. Mainly I'm on YouTube. So it's youtube.com forward slash Suki Baxter. And I'm at Suki Baxter on Instagram. Okay. Can you slowly spell Suki Baxter? Yes, it is S U K I E B A X T E R. Awesome. So youtube.com slash Suki Baxter, wholebodyrevolution.com. And for people who have been, um, you know, titillated by this conversation to think that there's something for them in the world that is more pleasant and empowered than, than the life we're living, your YouTube videos, your channel is such a resource. It is such a gift to the world, all the things that you share and put out. And not just the con not just the concepts or the uh, the exercises, but you know the spirit in which you do it, the the very intentional nervous system signals you are sending out. So I would I would love for people to go find it, study it, spend some time on it, and share it because it really is something that can uh, move the world in a good direction. I hope it does. So that's the intention behind it. All right. Well, Suki Baxter, thank you so much for all you do and for this really fun, delightful, uplifting conversation. This has been great. Thank you so much for having me. Take care.